I'm Adam Vokolo, and welcome to Stories Behind the Grind. This episode, I talk to the CEO of Youth Without Borders, Max Wosley. Max is working to build a platform to empower young people to create the change they want to see in the world by creating a sandbox to test and validate ideas before they launch. Max, welcome to Stories Behind the Grind. Uh, lovely to have you here today. Hi, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, so I guess before we get started, you just want to tell the community a little bit more about yourself. Sure. So at the moment, I run Youth Without Borders. and We're basically a platform that tries to provide equal access for all young people around Australia. We do that with a number of projects that we operate, some of which are residential camps for high school students. And one of our most recent projects that we've started is a social enterprise incubator for young people. We just finished our first run with that, which has gone awesome. What lessons have you learned from running the social incubator? Oh, that's a good question. The incubator was really one of the first new projects in Youth Without Borders that we've done in a while. And it was born out of, an, out of a realisation that we had doing our own research into what drove young people towards entrepreneurship and what could we do to increase that number, particularly for social entrepreneurship. And we conducted a bunch of research and spoke to a whole bunch of people who are actively involved in that and running their own social enterprises and discovered that the biggest barrier to young people specifically to getting into social enterprise was the, the perceived difficulty of the what we call the businessy things in, in inverted commas. So things like opening a bank account, what are the legal things that you need to set up? What are the legal entities? Does that cost money? I don't have any money, so I can't do that. Which is actually kind of ironic. Some of those things, once you've done it, is actually the easiest part of of building a business. But because of where a lot of young people come from, that is seen as the hardest part. And so we set up that program as an effort to break down as many of those barriers as possible. Rather than having to try and start your own business or having to incorporate a not-for-profit company, we wanted to get teams of young people to start up their own social enterprises underneath Youth Without Borders. So they didn't have to consider any of the businessy stuff, only had to focus on building cool stuff, which has gone really well. So we effectively try and recruit teams of young people from conferences or, or social enterprise conferences and things like that, where they're already united around a particular cause. And we take them through a process called human-centered design, which is basically problem-driven solution creation. So they find a problem, do a bunch of research, talk to a lot of people, come up with a bunch of ideas, test a bunch of those ideas, and then prototype and iterate. All the people that we've taken through that have found the customer research to be the coolest part because doing proper customer research is, is I think, a missing skill in a lot of organisations. And by just sitting down and talking to potential customers and getting those kinds of insights is absolutely fascinating. Can you delve a little bit more into the customer research side of things? Yeah. So I'm, I feel like I should say here that I'm, I'm definitely not a customer research professional. My background's in coffee and electrical engineering. And whilst I was at university and, and in some of the work I've been doing after university, I came across the, this, um, this process called human and design, fell in love with the process of creatively solving problems that genuinely impact people's lives. And the customer research part of it is so important to that process based on the very logical idea that you can't solve a problem for someone unless you've spoken to them about that problem. And it's particularly relevant in social enterprise projects. You hear a lot of stories of aid projects. My favourite story, and don't quote me on this because I probably can't find a source, was of a wealthy philanthropist who delivered a number of washing machines to a remote community in a developing country and came back two months later and discovered that they'd turned all the, that they'd taken the drums out of the washing machine and were using them as fire pits which is excellent for anyone who's ever used a washing machine drum as a fire pit. But that mistake was basically entirely based on the fact that if he'd gone into that community and spoken to them and discovered their needs, they would have found that one of their biggest issues was that because of the environment that they, that they lived in and the weather, it was quite difficult to get fires going and keep them going. And the drums actually did the perfect job for that. Getting that perspective is why it's so important. And in this day and age of creative business models and creative ways of making impact, you can get a huge amount of insight into how to change those, I guess, institutional problems just through going through that process. I was in India earlier this year with Pollinate Energy, 
Shout outs to the Pollinate crew. The challenge we were given was to look at ways to increase the standards of sanitation in the urban communities. We went through a week every afternoon going out and talking to the people, talking to them about did they use soap? How did they use it? What was the process that they used? Where did they get their products from? Looked at other communities and how that had high levels of, of sanitation. What were the things that we could draw back from that? And we discovered that there was actually a key behaviour in how they culturally examined water and the purification effect of water. From that insight, we discovered a way that we could tell the story and market, and market a hand sanitizer product to them, which is obviously a lot more sanitary than using just water. Because we got that insight into the behaviour, we knew how to tell the story and, and uh, change their behaviour to use the more sanitary product. So it's really about understanding the consumer, getting inside their head in a to a degree, understanding what their motivations are and their habits, and mm -hmm. from then developing a solution or developing some prototypes and then testing those. Mm -hmm. After all that, the, the key is just putting something in front of the customer, no, no matter how refined, seeing if they use it, how they use it. Because you're never, kind of stuff. you're never going to get it right the first go. It's always an oh, iterative process and never. continuously <laughs> improving. I think it's a very rare situation that people get it right the first go. <laughs> That must be a barrier to some sort of some of the entrepreneurs coming through the social incubator program as well, trying to get over the idea that it doesn't need to be perfect the first time, that it can that it can fail one, ten, a hundred, a thousand times before you get it right. Yeah, that is absolutely the the biggest barrier that we that we face. There's a lot of I guess like perfectionism taught in in a lot of schools, and what, which a lot a lot of students have in their minds that everything has to be perfect. And not even the product that you're trying that they're tr people try and build, but also in the process to get to that product. Um, the the priority is to get to a product that you think solves the job to test what it is that you're trying to figure out, and and see if see if it works or if it doesn't work. A lot of the barriers that we specifically try and focus on breaking down is getting people to be happy with sending you know sending out a customer survey because internally they feel that you know. That, that it's not perfect, so I can't send it out. Whereas really, if you're getting more, most of the information that you need, just send it out. Get the information, use the information, build something, send that out, and see how, see how that goes. What we found through this first run of the incubator that we've built is that there's a lot of mental barriers towards building things and putting them out there. Like There's, there's a lot of pride associated with having built something, mm. and then there's also fear of what if people don't like this thing that I've built. And all that, and all that effectively does is result in either A, the, the thing that you've built not going anywhere and, and not, not even getting, to the, getting into the hands of the consumer, or B, you spending so much time on building something that doesn't actually solve a problem. I, I recently went to San Francisco with an organisation called Startup Catalyst. Shout out to Startup Catalyst. On a trip that absolutely blew my mind. It was about 20 of us and we, we went over there for two weeks and met a, lot, a number of startup founders and we went to visit Facebook and Twitter and all those kinds of places. And we honestly, we, we thought that when we were going, it was going to be this awesome, you know, tech talks and we'd, figure, we'd find out how they, you know, how they deploy their servers and how they manage their um, deployments and all that kind of stuff. And there was a little bit of that, but the best thing was that we got the real talk from all of these entre entrepreneurs and founders of what the journey is like to build something and having to put it in people's hands and raising funds and all that kind of thing. And so much of the time we spoke about one of the biggest issues that they saw with Australian entrepreneurship is uh, imposter syndrome, where a lot of people feel like they're not qualified to do whatever it is that they're trying to build or if, even, even if they are qualified, then whatever they build you know, can't be up to scratch. And, and we see that everywhere. In, the, in, in this incubator. And so a large portion of that is trying to communicate pe with people of how to get over the imposter syndrome. And once, once we get over that barrier, that's when people start feeling the confidence of, of to be able to you know, build something, send it out, get it in front of people. And then it starts that positive cycle. So um, it's, all my, it's a mental battle. And once you can control that mental battle, yep. things start working in your favor. Yep. I mean, I, I feel imposter syndrome every day. <laughs> so what, what, what are some tips you have that you give to your social incubators to, to get over imposter syndrome? I think the only tip that you can really give is um, to acknowledge that it exists and understand that there is a huge amount of people all around, like, all around the world
world that experienced that every single day. We spoke to founders and entrepreneurs of some pretty big and well-known organizations around Silicon Valley. And they were like, yeah, I experience it. Like, who am I to be from, you know, wherever I am to be running this massive, you know, multi, like someone just gave me a few million dollars to run a company. How does this work? So the, really the, the first step is to acknowledge it, that it exists. And then the second step is to just ignore it. Yeah, so sort of, sort of back yourself and have that mm -hmm. confidence to push through. Yeah. Knowing that you may not get over it or you may get over it in the short term, but it may come back again, but it's always just pushing through and pushing through. Yeah, ab ab absolutely. And, um, and, and that's not an overnight process, right? And by surrounding yourself with other people um, that do cool things that, that, that you want to work with, who will, who will also back you in what it is that you're trying to do, definitely helps a lot. One of the best things from uh, the visit to San Francisco with Startup Catalyst was just the people that I went with. And now I have this amazing group of like-minded, very, very, very cool people that are based in Australia that I can that I can use to you know to lean on when I'm facing difficulties in what whatever I'm whatever I'm using and and I fully expect them to lean on me whenever they face the same. What advice do you have for those that I guess haven't been fortunate enough to go to startup catalysts but mm -hmm. want to surround themselves with like minded people to prove what they do? Very simply, just meet people. Be very open to the community, like where, wherever you're based. I mean or where, where, wherever you're based, like we're, we're in Brisbane, there's an absolutely incredible startup community here. There's an incredible social enterprise community here. And, you know, in, in places like Fishburners and the River Sea Labs and all the, all the co-working spaces, there's regular events that are around this. Go to the events and start meeting people, get their contact details, catch up with them for coffee or for beers or what, whatever, and just building that network. One of the one of the best ways that we that we found, and so, something else which blew me away about being in America was how generous people are. And every single conversation we had, someone would say, "You know, oh, how how can I help you?" And we're like, "What do you mean? Like, how do you think that a group of us could even think of helping you? Like, a, a, a startup founder in in San Francisco?" Until one person turned around and was like, "Oh yeah, and I, I, I know someone who can help you." Put them in contact and now they're good. After that, we, we, we really found the value of asking those questions in any interaction. And once, once you've met those people, feel free to ask that. I know that that definitely flares up a lot of people's feelings of imposter syndrome, but don't, don't be afraid to ask that. And that generosity often pays back in dividends. Then once you've built up that community and you know a whole bunch of people, uh, you'll, you'll find yourself moving towards what, what, whatever it is that you enjoy doing. That's um, some sage advice to anyone in the industry or wanting to, to, to delve into more of being an entrepreneur mm -hmm. or a business owner. If, if you want any advice on first steps to take, feel free to reach out to me. Actually, you mentioned before that you, you studied electrical engineering at university. How does someone from electrical engineering make the transition to CEO of uh, Youth Without Borders? What's been your journey so far? It's been a fun one. <laughs> so... To, to do a bit of a bit of a throwback to that story, um, when I was when I was young, I always wanted to be an inventor, and um, so through that I got pretty heavily into the into the STEM side of things, so science, maths, and then I um, was lucky enough to go to visit some of the um, particle accelerators and some other facilities like that. So I went to university first to study physics and electrical engineering with the view of, you know, eventually going into some kind of scientific research. Because obviously physics is, is super, super cool. I mean, anyone who's looked at anything in like um, quantum physics and anything um, will, will know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but I also wanted a bit of a practical side of things of how could I use these skills to actually build something. So that, that was why I did electrical engineering as well. When I was at university, a friend of mine pulled me in, well, pull, pulled me aside and said, mate, we're, we're starting up a camp for high school students who face barriers in life and face ba barriers to accessing tertiary education. And I want you to come and help staff it with me. I was like, sweet, that sounds cool. I'll, I'll get into that. So that, that was how I first got involved with Youth Without Borders on their um, the biggest project that I have called our Spark Engineering Camp. I had an awesome time. The team of people that I worked with were absolutely incredible. Um, there's definitely an element of unity through suffering. Like it, it was a lot of, it's, it's hard work putting on a residential camp like that. 
and then going to the camp and meeting all the high school students who came on who came on that and discovering how much value they got of some of the advice that we had to give and the experience that we were giving them was absolutely life-changing. So I stayed involved with that throughout university. Um, I ended up being the national, I helped grow that camp to Melbourne and I ended up being the national chair for Spark 2014. All throughout that, I was getting involved in the clubs and societies and president of the electrically based engineering student society at UQ. Also in 2014, that was a big year. And I basically realised that I, my favourite part about all of this was the collaborative working with other people to do cool stuff. And that, that was what I loved doing. By this time, I dropped the physics degree because I wanted to get out into the world and do stuff, and that would really just delay it. And I'd also realised that I absolutely suffer in uh, academic research environments <laughs> as a very strong extrovert. I need to be in big groups of people being creative and collaborative and all that kind of stuff. So I managed to get a graduate job at Deloitte in, in the technology consulting practice, and which was absolutely awesome. And I learned so much there, working with some pretty big clients on some very, very cool projects. And whilst I was there, I was also on the, on the board for Youth Without Borders. So I, I was still involved with the organisation, but at a bit more of a high-level governance perspective. And as a consultant, I learned all, all of the skills that I, that I wanted to learn. It's the, those skills in terms of like getting people on board with what, with what it is that you're proposing to build, what process do you go through to, build, to design or build those things, and just the other skills of presenting to a client and talking to clients and getting the information that you need and all, all those little things which on hindsight now are absolutely invaluable. So after two years there, the previous YWB CEO uh, stepped down. YWB was looking for a CEO. I just left the board in a, I've been involved in this organization for, I think it was five or six years at the time, you know, I've, do, I've done my time. And they, they approached me to, to apply. And so I was like, oh, fine, I'll, I'll come back in. So I, I took that job whilst I was still at Deloitte on the theory that Previously, I'd, I'd, I'd done big jobs like this on top of, uh, you know, regular full-time work. And I, but I very quickly realised that I could keep it going in that situation, but I couldn't build it to where I wanted it to go. So I unfortunately resigned from that job so that I could spend full-time on YWB. And that's been an awesome experience so far. So I've been in the role for about five months. I spend every day working with young people, building cool projects. We've been working a lot on changing the vision that we're trying to do and, and how we create the impact that we create, just trying to build that community um, around all the projects that operate underneath us. So, yeah. Must have been a pretty big decision for you to, to leave the corporate life, especially when there's a lot of social stigmatism around working a nine-to-five because that's a safe job to have. It's safe, it's reliable, you get a regular pay packet. It's quite risky to make that jump. Massively. <laughs> Did you have a It was a massive decision. It was and I can tell you the moment that I made that decision. <laughs> it was I was driving down to Byron Bay mm -hmm. with, with my partner and um, we were looking at the you know the, the, the career that I wanted to go and the places that I wanted to work and what were the things that I had to do to, do to get there and all that kind of thing. And I basically through that um, you know, we're having that conversation and I got my sticky notes out and did a objective analysis of all of it and we just kind of went oh man I'm, I'm, I'm gonna leave the corporate world it was an incredibly hard decision because I absolutely loved working at Deloitte mm. um, in consulting the the people that I worked with were incredible and it really did feel like an or feel like a family re regardless of which city in, in the country that we were working in and the work the work was super interesting as well but this, it felt like one of those opportunities that I, I couldn't let pass me by. And I had an opportunity to help build an organisation that has been such a big part of my life for almost seven years now. And I, I just couldn't pass it up. And they were incredibly supportive of, of my decision as well. In terms of risk, it's an interesting discussion. I had a lot of discussions about risk mm -hmm. of, of that move. Financially, absolutely. I mean, at the moment, I'm, I'm still a volunteer for YWB, so I, I don't get any money from, from them. And I guess that's, that's an important distinction to make. Oh, definitely. I mean, may, maybe that'll change in the future, but at, at the moment, it's, I'm, I'm still a volunteer. So there's obviously financial risk there. 
Having said that, I've, I've just, I have discovered that if you want to live cheaply and, and do cool stuff, then it's, it's actually quite easy to. You know, rent, rent isn't, isn't too bad where we are and living costs is, isn't a great deal. And from the other kinds of risk, like people spoke about career risk and that kind of thing, a lot of, you know, leaving a, a very safe job because it, it, it is safe and it feels very, it felt very safe. And there was definitely an element of that which, which made me w want to make the move as well. Like I, I, live, I live for being challenged. And if I'm, if I'm not being incredibly challenged, then I, I, look, I look for other ways to be challenged. And in terms of the experience that I'm getting from the perspective of career risk, in terms of running a company, we have almost 150 volunteers between Brisbane and Melbourne building new projects, managing and building that community and that culture as well has been a bigger part of the job than I expected, but a really but a super fun part of the job. And probably um, quite a rewarding aspect of it as, as absolutely. well. Absolutely. A lot of fulfilment from, from yep. seeing something grow. Yeah. Just to quickly overview how the, the structure of it is, mm. is that Youth Without Borders is a, almost like a, an umbrella corporation. <laughs> And underneath that exists a number of projects, which are all run by young people for other young people. What we aim to do with Youth Without Borders itself is to create an environment where the, where the young people running those projects are free to run it as they see fit. So we, we give them um, ultimate decision making on in terms of direction, growth, where they want to focus and, all, and all, all of those kinds of things. Obviously, we act as a governance body to make sure there's nothing you know, really terrible happening. We give them a lot of freedom in terms of how they, how they want to operate and how they do operate. And in the same sense that we're doing with the incubator, we, tr we are trying to facilitate and scale for them. So we try and remove all of the you know, accounting, financial, legal barriers towards operations so that they can focus on making impact and doing cool stuff and we can look after the, the back-end admin stuff. And now as an extension of that, we're looking at active ways that we can facilitate the personal development for the leaders of, of, the, of those organisations and the people on the committees that are running those projects. And you give them more experience mm -hmm. that they can then draw upon and then teach others. Yeah, absolutely. So the, there's an organisation called the Foundation for Young Australians, which has done some absolutely amazing research recently in terms of the future of work that young people will face and will operate in. As I'm sure a lot of the people listening to this podcast would know that the, the nature of work is changing to be a lot more flexible, um, a lot more freelance based, you know, the, the gig economy in, in inverted common. Mm. And to succeed in that environment, you need to have a, not just the technical skills of your, of your expertise, but also a lot of those soft skills, soft skills. Yeah. As, as much as I hate the term <laughs> soft skills, that's exa exactly it. So that creative problem solving strategic thinking, being able to build and manage a team of people to deliver something and managing those relationships and that kind of thing, dealing with issues as they arise in creative ways, and then all the other hard skills of you know, managing a budget, stakeholder management and all that kind of thing. And as much as I think a lot of the universities will try and impart that knowledge to students by doing lectures, we believe that the only way to learn that is by getting your hands dirty and getting into it. And making um, those mistakes and then learning from them um, and then just improving. Absolutely. So by, by having all the problems thrown at you all at once and by dealing with that, it also builds up their confidence mm. that they can deal with it, but also those skills in, and because you have that experience of dealing with whatever issues come your way as early as possible in, in terms of age. And then once people either leave YWB or move on to other projects or things like that, they take that experience and skills and where the place where they've already either failed once or, or managed those problems is less likely that those issues can be a problem again. Someone was joking the other day about YWB Incubator potentially being the first failure or, or trying to make it as the, the first failure for people to come in and experience that. It really um, gives, it gives people a safe place to, mm -hmm. to fail mm -hmm. and to learn. Um, and having a supportive structure around them yep. through that process. Absolutely. And, that, and that's also why that structure of those teams coming in to, to sit underneath YWB is so beneficial because A, they're not, they're not stuck in a for-profit or not-for-profit business model. All they need to do is validate the product that they're selling or, or creating more service or whatever. But also if it completely goes down, then they're not, they don't have to wind up a company or do anything like that. It shuts down then it just stops operating and there's, and there's very little other consequences of that. And that, that's very intentional 
mm. in, in that design. And, and I guess it, exactly like you say, a, a safe safe space to fail. Mm. Plus, you're removing people's excuses for, for running these yep. sort of businesses. No, no longer can they go. Oh, I don't have the accounting knowledge, so I can't do it. Yeah, I don't know the legal uh, expertise to to start. It really removes all those excuses and goes. If you've got an idea, you can run with it. Yeah, and see where it goes. Yeah, absolutely. My uh, our, our attitude is. Um, if you have an idea and you want to do something, build it. Like, just start. Mm. Just do it. doesn't matter if the if what you've built is super crappy or whatever. As long as you're building something and you're and whenever you come up with an idea that you're um, making efforts to, to take it to market and see if it works, then you're absolutely on the right track. But if you're just kind of at the stage of throwing ideas out with a bunch of mates over beers and not following up, then you're, you're not going to get any closer to where you want to be. Mm, ideas really mean nothing without execution behind Absolutely. Them. Yeah. And even even if you're if you have an idea that that requires some coding skills, learn to code. There's a bunch of sites out, sites out there that can teach you the absolute basics. And even if it looks like complete shit and the code is ter- absolutely terrible, at least you're building something and putting it in front of people. And that that is the absolute priority. And then once you've got to once you have a couple of customers and you know, you're getting to that stage. That that's when you can hire a professional developer who knows exactly what they're doing and why there's a bunch of flaws in what you've already built. But at least you haven't spent a hundred hundred grand on developers building something which you don't even know is accept, is wanted by the market. And it comes back down to your human centered design, mm-hmm. understanding your consumers or your potential customers, mm-hmm. seeing what they want, see what problems they have, and yep. developing a solution yep. to Absol- help them. Absolutely, that is exactly why it works. Why well, it's great? Any um, any any final advice that you'd have for those sitting on the fence? Uh, uh, besides, just like you said before, just do it. That's it, Re- really. If you're still you know working in that nine to five job and you have an idea and you want to build it, build it. It'll take up take up a reasonable amount of your spare time and it'll take up a bu- probably a bunch of your weekend. I cannot emphasize enough how great the feeling is of having something that you've built or designed being put in the hands of someone to use and then going, this is awesome. It is the best feeling in the world. In terms of those you know, looking to quit their job or whatever to build a startup, this is the first step. Build that really shitty minimum viable product that you can put out to the market and validate how it is. And then once you know that there's a market and you've potentially got some revenue, that, that's when you start having conversations with, with your employer or, or other people around, around that kind of thing. You know, there's, there's a lot of rhetoric around startups and social enterprises and, and anything like that around that test or build prototype, you know, test and learn cycle. Applying that to your own career is also an excellent way to look at, to look at it. So in the same sense that you shouldn't build and invest a huge amount and build a product and then throw it out there, completely quitting your job just to build something that you don't know is almost as bad. By taking that test and learn attitude to your career, you can have discussions around either cutting cutting the amount of days that you work or maybe working more flexibly or even just taking a small amount of unpaid leave or paid leave, even better, to build and test that prototype before you really commit into it. But I mean, once all that's validated, go for it. I mean, for for me, I I was lucky enough to be able to to steal on my uh, old skills as a barista to pay the rent and bills for the first few weeks until I um, figured figured out some other ways to for some money to come in. But it, it's really just up to you to to be creative and to and to, to test it out and see what works. Great advice, Max. Thanks, mate. Wonderful. Thanks for your time today. And absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for listening. Would really appreciate it if you left a rating. For more inspiring stories and advice, follow Stories Behind the Grind on Instagram and Facebook.